you for joining us for another week of Press Row. Joined as always by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz, I'm Matt Finkel. District week for boys basketball and in Division One, Lima Senior certainly the favorite in the University of Toledo district. They'll have a game Thursday against Whitmer, and if they win, they'll play the winner of Northview and Toledo St. John's. Which game poses a bigger threat for the Spartans? You know, I, I think uh, St. John's is a more capable team, but I think in some ways the Whitmer game is a bigger trap for Lima Senior because even though Whitmer took them to the wire a few weeks ago up there with uh, Jay Thomas out of the lineup, I, I still think the Spartans know that Whitmer is probably not good enough to beat them, so it could lead to looking ahead to St. John's. So I think that's a bit of a trap game, but I think St. John's is the better team. And of course, Lima's already beaten both of them twice, so I'll leave the cliche up to others, but there will be a third meeting with both these teams if it works out. The interesting thing to me for Lima Senior is we've seen this pattern emerge the last several weeks where they've let teams kind of hang around for a half, hang around for three quarters. In the fourth quarter, they finally put them away. You do that against a Whitmer, Whitmer or a St. John's, There's some better quality teams, teams that know Lima Senior very well. You put those teams in a close game, anything could happen. So I think you really need to see the Spartans come out and really play a good first half and really set the tone early. And I, I think Whitmer might be a little bit more dangerous than St. John's. The, the other interesting part about this entire dynamic with St. John's is the fact that they don't have Ed Heinchel, their head coach, on game days. He is suspended by the school for some recruiting violations. He is allowed to practice the team. He can prepare the team, but come game day, they hand it over to the assistants. I think it's right now it's definitely the Whitmer game. If you're going by the one game at a time, one step at a time, Mentality See, coaches and players have to do that. Media, we don't. <laughs> we can look I know, ahead. we can look at But I'm going to say right now, it is Whitmer. And Todd, you touched on it. Two close games against Whitmer this year. It, you know, I think it's it is tough to beat a very good team three times in a row. We saw what happened last year when St. John's tried to pull the trifecta on Lima Senior in the regional semifinal. Spartans beat the brakes off of them. If they come out complacent, somebody could jump up and get them. If Lima Senior wants to advance to the regionals, they've got to jump on both of these teams early, keep the, fo keep the foot on the gas pedal, and don't let up until there's triple zeros on the clock in the fourth quarter. Yeah, the Spartans had a, a pattern through most of the year where they would get out to quick starts and then kind of cruise, but never really get threatened. Um, when they played Whitmer up there, Lima played from behind throughout that game, mm -hmm. and, and I think they're much more adept, as most teams would be, to play with the lead. But I think when Lima gets a lead on you, other teams panic very quickly because they realize that Lima can go on big runs at any time. If we're already down 10 or 12, we're in big trouble. So I think it would behoove them to try and get out to better starts and get big leads and put the pressure, put the onus on the other team. I don't, I don't think Whitmer is capable of making big comeback against Lima, but they'll slug it out with them and play with them throughout the game if, if you let it go that way. Now, Lima Senior's used to playing in Toledo, but having to go there Thursday and then again Saturday against potentially two teams who play in Toledo, might that be a disadvantage for Lima? Yeah, may, slightly, but I, I don't think it's a big problem. This team has done a lot of traveling this year. I think they're fairly well rested after a relatively easy run through the sectional. I don't think it's really a problem. And you got to remember St. John's had to go to Lakota for their sectional last week. so. Uh, they did some traveling last week as well. I think that is a negligible effect. Well, also remember the regular season where Lima Senior had a game in Kettering on late Monday, and then right. they were up in Toledo on Tuesday playing yes. the game. So yep. they, they've done this before, and the fact that they had that early game on Thursday, that gives them a little bit of a cushion to it. Sure. And the old school Spartans are going to say, traveling, this is nothing compared to what we used to do in the old days, right. going two hours one way down to Cincinnati back in the GMC days. It's tradition, you know. Yeah, it is tradition, and some traditions die. Yes, they do. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the other team in Lima, and we'll do this like Mad Libs. LCC's biggest challenge to Columbus is blank. Injury. LCC. Bluffton. No opponent? I was going to say, I was waiting for the opponent. <laughs> Bluffton's yeah. the next opponent. <laughs> I, I, well, there you go with the coach speak. Now. Exactly. Yeah. Occasionally, you got to slip back into it. We, we talked about Bluffton last week on Press Row, we, and we thought they could be a, a lower seed that could make it to the district final. And sure enough, they got the victory over Coldwater. And the thing that makes Bluffton so difficult, they've got a lot of different guys who can beat you in a lot of different ways. But I, I think LCC, they need to just keep a, 
looking at the next opponent because I think without a doubt the T-Birds are the favorite to get back to Columbus. So as long as they don't put that apple too far ahead of the cart, just keep an eye on it. the next line, I think they're in good shape. It'll be a good matchup, and I stuck around to watch the Coldwater Bluffton game uh, last Friday night at, at Elida after the LCC Riverdale game, which was close until tip-off. Um, you know, Bluffton's got some athletic players, and going into that game, their losses were by a combined 21 points this year. This Bluffton team's pretty good. They're very athletic. They're not big, but they've got good. They've got some decent size. They've got some good quickness. Can they hang for it with LCC for four quarters? We'll see you tomorrow night. Yeah, I think uh, Bluffton will have a good game plan. They'll play hard, and it could be relatively close. But again, I, I think I, I said injury. The other thing that could fail the T-Birds is, is foul trouble, and the Cobbs Walton duo. Uh, has to be able to play at full strength in full minutes uh, the way Coach Kill wants them to play and when he wants them to play. Uh, any foul trouble between one or both of those, especially both, could be a hindrance against a better team. And Just also, look for the thumbs up. They'll give it to the coach. Yeah, well, yeah. and keep in mind, Todd Boblet is a Jim Rookie disciple. Mm -hmm. And you talk about Jim Rookie, we saw this against Lima Senior. The Finley Trojans, they're not afraid to slow it down. Bluffton Pirates aren't afraid to slow it down right. either. So Bluffton very well could go to some stall tactics and try and extend that game and, and make possessions longer to keep the ball away from LCC. And I think, think T-Birds are also prepared for any kind of exotic defenses that we used to call junk defenses as well. Triangle and two. Right. Any combination of geometrical figures and numbers could be out there at any given time. I think LCC's biggest obstacle to Columbus could be the district final, whether it's Spencerville or Wayne Trace. Some say Spencerville may have been underachieving this year. If you get to a big game district final, those a lot of seniors on that team as well. I think they could give the T-Birds some trouble. Wayne Trace too. Ethan Linder can go off on yeah. any night. Remember, they went to the D4 state semis last year. Jim Linder's a good coach. They're experienced. I think that could be a problem that, for us. That's going to be a really good game with game, you know, as far as game one with Wayne Trace and Spencerville. And you're going to see Wayne Trace try to get up and down the floor and run. And if they can do so, I mean, I think that does favor slightly Wayne Trace. But there's a ton of experience. So with a lot of these kids only being juniors, too, at Spencerville, they're three-year varsity basketball players. And Kevin Sensball knew it when this group came in of juniors as freshmen. He goes, we may as well go with the youth movement now. And it's paid off with those freshmen and sophomores now being juniors and seniors. You know, LCC and Spencerville played a couple of weeks ago, and, yep. and the T-Birds won fairly handily. But I got a feeling Spencerville didn't really show much strategically. I think they just let it play out if they won. They won if they didn't. They didn't. Uh, I think they've put every egg of their legacy ba in the basket of beating LCC in the district final. So and going uh, back Spencerville to LCC, is going to be low. season game. If you remember, LCC jumped up the big lead. Spencerville didn't pack it in. Right. They came back, made a run of their own, made that a ball game. So in Spencerville's mind, if they get past Wayne Trace, I think Spencerville believes they can play with LCC. No doubt. So that, that, that's going to be an interesting backstory if we get that matchup. Well, you look at the Spencerville season, and Matt touched on how they've sort of underachieved. Uh, they didn't win the league. No. They really didn't win many, if any, of the big games on their schedule. This is it. The LCC game coming up is it. Uh, they just have to make sure they don't look past Wayne Trace. As Aaron said, they're very capable of beating the Bearcats if they can get in an up-and-down game. Well, speaking of potential postseason rematches, we're getting one on Friday night between Lincoln View and Crestview. And Lincoln View beat Crestview in the regular season. You think the postseason game will follow that same script? Get there early. It's going to be packed. <laughs> yeah. Good thing it's at the field house. There are plenty of seats. Yes. Uh, you know, I, obviously the first game was at Lincoln View. I think that was a help. Uh, Crestview maybe wasn't at 100%, so that maybe leads you to think it could go the other way this time. Uh, Jeremy Best is an outstanding coach, so to, to beat his team twice is, is another thing that maybe you lean toward Crestview. And let's face it, Lincoln View, Crestview, they don't like each other in a good way. So it's going to be fun, whoever wins. Well, hey. I think when you look at these two, I think these are two teams that are trending in opposite directions. Lincoln yeah. View has kind of limped into the postseason. They've had the injury situation with Trevor Neat. While Crestview, they got Cody Mefford back. And the other thing to remember with the Crestview Knights, they're a very young team. They've got three or four freshmen that play quite a bit. Those kids are no longer freshmen. They're almost sophomores now because you're through the full season. So I think Crestview might be a little bit better than Lincoln View going into this district championship. Yeah. I can only imagine the coffee shop talk in Van Wert <laughs> between the two communities uh, today, Thursday morning, Friday morning. This is must-see. If you're looking for a game Friday night in our area, this is the one, in my opinion, to go watch. No disrespect to the other teams. 
playing for district finals. These two teams are going to go up and down the floor. They're going to have fun. It's going to be a 32-minute war, and unfortunately, a very good basketball team is going to be looking ahead to baseball and track Saturday morning. We'll have that game on WOSN Friday at 10.30. Now what's interesting, I called both those games to both district semifinals and both Crestview and Lincoln View were tested midway through the fourth quarter, tie games, and both teams were able to pull it out. Uh, they're used to playing in tight games and like you said, they don't like each other. Trevor Neat did play, he did not start in the district semifinals, so we'll, we'll see if that's a factor. And of course, Cody Mefford being back for Crestview, he did not play the first time that they played Lincoln View. See how that factors in. Elsewhere in D4 at Wapakoneta, we've got Perry and St. Henry after their district semifinal wins. Who do you like in that district final? Can I play Kirk Herbstreit on this one, guys, since I'm calling it on Friday sure, night? Sure, why not? I'll give you keys to the game. For Perry, it's two things. they got to stay out of foul trouble, and they've got to dictate tempo in this game. Uh, and St. Henry, they, are, they, they can slow things down. They can be very methodical, or they can get out and run either. They've got to pick a side and stay with that side and use it to their consistency you know, throughout that game in order to be successful. Well, it's interesting you brought up the foul trouble, Aaron, because Perry had foul trouble Big time. against Fort Recovery, and that usually spells their doom, but they were able to get by the Indians. Uh, I, I've got a good feeling about Perry. I think this is, this is finally it. Uh, it really boggles my mind. They've never won a district title uh, down through the years. It's one of those statistical anomalies, and I think they're about to shove that aside and make some history. It'll be a good game, no doubt, but I think the Commodores, that win the other night against Fort Recovery, might have been the key for the win in the district final because if they do get a little foul trouble, they've proven to themselves they can work around it, work through it. Uh, I like Perry in this game. Having called the two semifinal games from Wapakoneta, here's what I can tell you about these two teams. While St. Henry has got good size, it's not the same type of size we saw at a Fort Recovery. St. Henry doesn't have that Micaiah Cox who's going to set up in the post, get Kobe Glover in foul trouble, and if Glover gets out of the game, really can dominate. St. Henry's big guys, Kneecamp and Layfeld, they like to hang out outside, they like to shoot three-point shots, and that opens up the lane for Mitchell Stallman to drive and draw fouls. Now, Perry has got the lateral quickness to be able to contain Mitchell Stallman on those drives. I think Perry's quickness will be the key to this game, and even if they do get into foul trouble, I still think Perry's going to be able to pick up this victory. All right, let's close with this. Cutting down the nets, let's get your opinion on it. Is it a waste of time, time-honored tradition? Would you practice cutting down the nets? <laughs> I, think, I think all of that figures in. Uh, I've always been of the mind that you shouldn't cut nets at sectional, but I'm also of the mind that some teams don't get to cut down nets very often, so they <laughs> win a sectional and they do it. Uh, you know, the beauty is it can mean different things to different teams. You know, a team like Lima Central Catholic that's been to state won the state, all this in recent history with these kids. You know, if they cut down the net at sectional, they're only doing it because they feel like they're supposed to. For other teams, Bluffton hadn't won a sectional in 16 years. They were excited as can be, and it's all good to me. I, if it was up just to me, all things being equal, I would not cut nets at sectional. That would be reserved for a district title. I will say this, though. You talk about Bluffton. It was really cool watching that net cutting and the Bluffton side – Nobody had moved. They were still there watching. It was their first time in 16 years that this had happened. Really cool moment to see them get that opportunity. You know, some they just do it because that's just, I guess that's what you're supposed to do. Right. And, you know, I talked to Frank Kill about it, you know, regarding LCC, and he said, well, we've done it every year in the last seven, eight years. It's worked pretty well for us. We might as well keep doing it. Yeah, he probably figures that the one year they don't cut nets of the sectional, that's when they'll lose at the district. So <laughs> we did it that way every other time. We got to keep doing it, right? If I was a coach, I absolutely would have my team practice it as well for two <laughs> different reasons. Motivation, and also I don't want my kids out there not knowing what they're supposed to do at any point before, during, or after a basketball game. You have to have your team prepared for everything that's going to happen during a game. If you're going to cut down the nets, you need to practice it. Jim Valvano used to do that all the time. First practice of the season, he wouldn't even have a basketball. would just have scissors so his team would practice it. Then I'd put the scissors away, talk with my AD, see what the budget is for nets, and maybe <laughs> midway through the season, pull it out after a good practice as a little a little bit of a, of a motivating factor against, hey, that's a good practice, guys. Let's cut down the nets because we're going to be doing this in six weeks. Hey, coaches, this guy was available. <laughs> <laughs> ADs? Oh, boy. Keep away from the petitions. <laughs> well, we'll see a handful of teams cut down some nets this weekend at Districts for Boys Basketball. That does it for this week's Press Row. Thank you, much, very, thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next week.